talk yet. You probably will. Um, and I would like to do, introduce um, today's speaker, Dr. L. Peter Deutsch. Um, I met Peter several years ago, and I know him as a very talented and welcoming member of the Bay <coughs> Area modern square dancing community. Perfect dancing for geeks. Um, all about patterns. Um, I also learned um, very quickly that he is a very prominent member of the international computer science community. Um, Dr. Deutsch earned his PhD at, in computer science at UC Berkeley and has worked at Xerox Park and at Sun Microsystems. Um, in 1994, he was introduced as a fellow um, of the Association of Computing Machinery, one of the top awards. Um, as a software engineer, uh, Dr. Deutsch is the creator of Ghost Script, which is an implementation of the PostScript document formatting language, um, and is the author of Definitive Small Talk and Lists um, Implementations. So, um, but recently, um, in March 2011, he was awarded a Master's of Arts um, by CSU East Bay in Music, and as of mid-2011, he has six compositions um, performed in public concerts and now generally identifies himself as a composer rather than a software engineer. Um, this morning he told me that he is in pre-production for his um, second music CD and um, is looking forward to that. So let's welcome Dr. Bush. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. So um, I was actually expecting to have 45 minutes for this talk, so I'm going to talk really fast and I'm probably going to leave out a couple of things. Um, so just, just to give me an idea of how to pitch the talk, how many of you have either read or written a computer program? Great. How many of you have either read or written a program in C or C++? Oh, good. This is going to make things a lot easier. <laughs> okay. So then I'm just going to start right in. Um, so uh, as, as you might have gathered from Kia, um, I've actually kind of been, been, uh, been retired from serious software development uh, since about 2002. So there, there are recent developments I'm sure I'm not aware of, uh, but the illustrations for my talk are all uh, from within the last few months. And I think the problems are all still there. So, so this talk is about software, about software quality. Um, and I want to be clear that I'm talking about system software the operating systems, and the other kind of ubiquitous code that's in our lives right now. Um, quality failures in this kind of software, in system software, can harm millions of people. So this is, this is the software where, where quality, in my opinion, really matters the most. Um, so I'd, to get started, I'd like to, I'd like to talk about you know, what quality means. And I'm going to define it as being the absence or the negative of failures. And so what, in, how, how is it that software can fail? So here are what I see as the types of software failures. It can crash, it can produce incorrect, out, produce incorrect output. It can incorrectly grant or deny privilege. Those you know, are, are pretty clear security failures. There's denial of service. And there's excessive or unbounded resource consumption. So um, just, just a tiny bit of terminology here. I want to distinguish between a failure and a fault. A failure is an undesired event. A fault is something wrong with the code that led to that failure happening. I think this is pretty common terminology. <coughs> so um, when we talk about different kinds of failures, um, I, I'd like to tell you what I think of as being a security failure, as opposed to you know, sort of general reliability failure. A security failure, I would say, is one that is not confined to a single user within that user's scope of privilege. So for example, so in particular, any failure that affects more than a single user so that a malicious user can affect others by triggering that failure should be considered a security failure. This is a pretty, pretty wide definition of security failures. Um, and the same fault may, may cause a reliability general reliability failure if it's in an application, but it may cause a security failure if it's in, if it's in an operating system. So, uh, so programmable digital computers have been in use in, the, in pretty wide use in the civilian world for, I'd say, about 60 years. Um, 
And a variety of approaches have been proposed to improve the quality of the software, that is to, to say, to reduce the rate of faults and failures. And I think of them as kind of <coughs> falling into these four rubrics. Um, and so, so people have looked at ways to improve programming languages, you know, so that, so that just by the nature of the language, fewer faults and fewer failures are, are possible. Uh, they've talked about different ways to test software. Uh, they've talked about improving the process for developing software. And they have, there have been some issues having to do with the legal environment surrounding software. Uh, I'm going to come back and talk about this briefly at the end of the talk. But in fact, the talk is only about the first of these. Uh, the first one, the programming languages, is the only one of these topics that is pretty much entirely technological. Uh, and I'll say why I think that's where the money is. With respect to, to testing, there was a famous and unfortunately now, now deceased computer scientist named Edgar Dijkstra. Uh, and one of his most famous sayings is, testing cannot show the absence of bugs, only their presence. And I am a dijkstrist. Uh, that may be because I have a math background and I'm a really strong believer in, in, formal, you know, in, in, in formal systems. Um, and I would say that something similar is also true of improving the development process. Uh, if you improve <coughs> the development process, you can reduce the likelihood of faults, uh, but, you, but you can't show their absence. Um, so for example, code reviews by somebody other than the, than the developer is a good way to reduce faults. But it has the same issues as testing. And the legal stuff I'll talk about at the end. So we're talking, so you know, now that we're focused on programming languages and, and how they can, re can help reduce the, the failure rate, um, I'd like to introduce what I think is the, the most important modern idea in programming <coughs> language design. And that is the idea of a contract. So, in ordinary life, what a contract amounts to is you have two parties, A and B, and they make an agreement. And if each of them holds up their end of it, the other one can, uh, you know, can can proceed on on the in the confidence that that whatever it is that, that the other party promised will happen. And then we have this whole legal system for enforcing them and and, and uh, you know all those all those messy things that, that come about from the fact that we're people and not software. Uh, but, but the idea of contracts in software uh, is actually a modern one. Well, all of software is modern, but, but let, let's not go there. So I first remember the term contracts for software being used by Bertrand Meyer in the design of his iPhone programming language. Uh, and the date that I found for that is 1986. And, and it's, it's, the idea for software is pretty much like the idea for, for people. Uh, so contracts refer to the idea that, that if you have some, some software entity, a module, a procedure, whatnot, uh, A, and it uh, calls entity, module, procedure, whatever, B, then you can have in the programming language a contract whereby uh, the two of them agree that B guarantees that if the input from A satisfies some condition, then B will operate correctly and will produce output that satisfies perhaps some other condition. So once a contract is in place, and, and you know, this isn't just a comment. I mean, we're talking about something that can be expressed in the programming language. Then, it, then if the language implementation, meaning typically compiler, can enforce that contract uh, on A, it completely eliminates a potential category of failures from the execution of B. Now, the idea of checkable interfaces between software modules, I mean, you've all written programs in, in C-like languages, and, and you're familiar with the idea of, of, um, of type declarations for procedure parameters and procedure results. And that idea predates, predates Meyer by quite a lot. Um, Meyer extended, it extended this idea of interface checking to a, a much richer set of mechanically checkable conditions. And, and it's also kind of at the heart of his design philosophy. So there are so there are two two things that I want to, to um, observe about about software contracts as an idea. So the first is that the earlier that a contract can be enforced, 
the greater is its value for improving the quality of the software. And there's, as an example of this kind of from the, from the ordinary world, if you want to buy a house, how many of you have ever, have, ever, have ever bought a house? That's kind of what I would have expected. <laughs> um, but so when you go to buy a house, the seller's agent would usually ask for something called a proof of funds, some documentation that you can give them that <coughs> shows that you actually have the money that you say you do for buying this house. And that is an, kind of an early check that you'll be able to satisfy your side of the purchase contract before the seller has made plans that you know, may depend on the sale going through, like you know, selling their house, or uh, buying another house, I should say. Now, in the software world, there are at least three different times that a contract between two software entities can be checked. Um, they can be checked at compile time, and as, uh, as I'll say in just a couple of moments, um, uh, type declarations are a kind of contract. And those, are, and those are typically checked at, uh, at compile time. They can be checked at link time. Some software systems, but not, but, but not by any means all, and not any of the C implementations that I'm familiar with, um, will check when you link two software modules together, will check that in fact the caller and the callee uh, both agree on the type signature of the, of the, uh, of the, of the callee. Uh, and then, of course, they can be checked at runtime. So, for example, again, getting ahead of myself a little bit, if you, in, in languages other than C, when you, when you write an array subscripting operation, A sub I, there's kind of an implicit contract attached to that that you're guaranteeing that I is within the bounds uh, of, of A. Uh, and that contract in languages that I have a higher opinion of uh, will, in fact, be checked at runtime. So the first two of these are, are often called static checking because if a contract figure is going to occur, it occurs before the, the program has ever been executed. And so that check can be made, and if the check passes, it gives you a guarantee across all possible executions of that program, which is a very, very strong and very desirable situation. Now, if you do contract checking at runtime, if if the if the check fails, typically you know the, the program will will you know will crash will will exit. And now this isn't as bad as it sounds because presumably the reason that that contract is there and that check is there is to prevent some more serious failure from happening if, if execution were allowed to continue. Um, but but that's still a failure of execution from the user's point of view. Uh, and also runtime checking is likely to slow things down and take more money and whatnot. So so. I'm going to talk almost entirely about um, static checks, about compile time checks, compile time enforcement of contracts. So the other aspect of contracts that I kind of want to call, call out at this point is that programming languages themselves, not just interfaces between the procedures or whatever, but the programming language itself is absolutely permeated by contracts. And the primary form of contracts in programming languages is, is the declaration. And um, since nearly all of you have written or read programs in C-like languages, um, I don't have to explain what the th three little code snippets mean. Uh, but notice that, that a declaration creates a contract between all the places that set the variable and all the places that use the variable. The places that set the variable guarantee that they're going to set it to a value that's in range. And the places that use the variable can then know that the value will be in range uh, when, when it reads it. Now, you know, for something, you know, something like a plain type declaration, that's you know, not very interesting or profound. But if you're doing memory management, there is a kind of a pervasive contract across the whole program uh, having to do with uh, proper use of memory allocation and freeing. And, and, uh, and it, it couples allocs and frees not only to each other, but to every use of a pointer. Um, so those of you who, who uh, have programmed in languages like Python and JavaScript may not see that declarations are all that desirable. Um, I think that any language that doesn't have at least type declarations is unsuitable for building long-lived, high-quality software. Um, and there's a reference in my handout 
that leads to, that that uh, links to uh, what I think is quite a well written article uh, on 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 the kind of higher level highest level issues that motivate this position. Uh, just just to you know get your interest up a little bit, the title of the article is <coughs> "Why Programmers Shouldn't Call Themselves Engineers." So now declarations. Um, I, I see a couple of people smiling. So you, you might you might want to come and chat with me about this after the talk. So so declarations are not the only contracts that are important in, in programming languages. Um, they're they're you know explicit contracts in terms of, of uh, type type declarations for interfaces to procedures. But then there is what I would think call sort of a pervasive contract having to do with memory management. Now, you might say, well, you know, Malik and Free are just these library procedures. You know, why, why do you talk about them being part of the language? Well, in fact, the language does have constructs in it for memory allocation. Uh, whenever you write a declaration for, um, for a structure for an array that's going to be allocated in the procedure frame, um, you've entered into a contract that says, for example, that that um, a, that you won't attempt, you won't create a, a pointer to that object and then attempt to use it after the procedure has returned. And that contract is implicit in the definition of the language. And because there's no distinction at the language level between pointers to stack allocated memory and pointers to heap allocated memory, heap allocation uh, then kind of uh, has to be viewed together with stack allocation as creating this, this set of conditions for, for proper management of memory. So memory management is a good example of a special kind of contract. I called it, a moment ago, I called it the per pervasive contract. It's also called, uh, it's also often called an invariant. Uh, how many of you have heard the term invariant before uh, in the context of programming languages? Okay, great, not very many. Um, it's, it's heard more often in, in the context of kind of theoretical computer science, but it's a really, really important concept for, for people who write software. And, and this is a contract, um, and, and so, so I would characterize an invariant as a contract that is made in one place, uh, namely, in this case, the definition of, of malloc and, and C's memory allocation that has to be enforced in many, many places that, that may be remote from uh, those that have to guarantee the contract. So, so type and interface declarations are contracts that are checked at, at very specific times, uh, assignment time, call time. But every use of free, every time a program frees memory, that imposes, that, that interacts with all other uses of free and every use of a pointer. And so, in my opinion, it's, it's precisely the fact that, that every use of free potentially interacts with a huge number of statements in the entire program um, that, that makes C's handling of memory so pernicious. So, so, so here I am about halfway into the talk and I'm, fi I'm finally going to get to the point of the talk or the thesis of the talk, which is that a large proportion of system software failures occur because the programming language and the programming language implementation enforces neither the contracts that are implicit in the language definition, nor the contracts that the language's notation leads programmers to expect to be enforced. So uh, you'll see in a moment what I mean by the latter, but the former. Here are a litany of things that C programs do wrong all the time. <coughs> And the definition of the C language makes all of these things invalid. But the typical C implementation, in fact, all C implementations known to me, either don't attempt to enforce any of these contracts or do a really uh, fragmentary job on them. Now, and, and as I said, this, these, are, these are contracts that are implicit in the definition of the C language. Now, you know, I said, there, is also, there are also implicit contracts that you would expect from the notation. And here are three of them. If you look at symbols like add and multiply and greater than and assignment, you would expect <coughs> the things before the question mark to be true. But none of them are true in C in general. Now, once you've learned the C language, 
you understand that they aren't true in general, and you understand why they aren't true in general. But you have to keep that in your mind all the time. Every time you write an add or a multiply, uh, especially in conjunction with, with comparison, you have to remember, no, that plus doesn't really mean add. It means add modulo 2 to the something. Same thing for multiply. Same thing for assignment. You have to think, no, this doesn't mean assign the value. It means assign the value, but maybe truncate it. So, so and, and as I said, you know, on, both on this slide and the previous slide, these things in general are not detected or enforced even at runtime. Some C compilers, the better C compilers, may give you warnings. Who reads warnings? <laughs> There's just too many of them. So what's the relationship of all of this to the real world? Well, I'm sure you've all seen you know, all these new news articles that, that report security failures in, in massively used websites, massively used software. Um, but but you know, those articles often don't say what it was that caused the failure. So, so I did a small unscientific experiment to see if I could you know, get some idea of, of just how serious these, these failures to uh, these, these non, this non-enforcement of, of language contracts is. Um, I, I run Linux on my desktop, of which we're going to Linux. And uh, its patch policy is that there's a pretty much a, a constant stream of very small patches. Um, the the um, that environment is set up so that it's possible to patch individual modules. Uh, and there's, there's typically, there are typically a bunch of patches that come out every day or two, just some module or other. So I picked three batches of patch updates, more or less at random. They just, they just had to be enough patches that I could get some statistics, statistics on them. Um, and, these, and these were all patch bundles involving uh, widely used and mature code. They're, they're you know, libraries or packages that are you know, in, in wide use. And I asked myself, OK, how many of the patches were addressed to faults of the kinds that I've just now been talking about? And there's the answer. In each of these three patch bundles, at least half of the faults were caused by exactly the phenomena that I've been, that I've been railing about. So the problems are real. So I hope I hope by now I've persuaded you that that you know contract failures at, of the language's own contracts um, are are a real and serious problem. So are, are they a problem with every language? I think this is the point at which I am going to short circuit some of my talk, but let me just give you a little taste. These slides are all the, are, will all be on my website by tomorrow, and the URL is in the handout, which. Where are the handouts? It's them over here and some people got them. Great. So here are five languages that I'm familiar, very familiar with, and their introduction dates. And so <coughs> these languages have um, varying degrees of ability to handle, to handle uh, integer overflow. And they have varying degrees of ability to handle various kinds of memory issues. Um, you will notice that C and C++ um, really gets the dunce cap. Uh, all, all of these other languages have automatic freeing, also sometimes called garbage collection. I included Lisp because I love it and also because um, it, uh, to my knowledge, was the first language that implemented garbage, the first language implementation that included garbage collection in 19, sometime between 1958 and 1960. So if you, if you look at, you know, if you look at, uh, at these lines, the one that looks best is Python. Lots of people love Python. I used to love Python. Um, and so you might ask, well, why don't we just write all our system software in Python? You know, it's a great language. <coughs> well, Python has some pretty large problems. It doesn't have static type checking, and you've heard my opinion about, about type checking already. Um, Python, alone among the, the other languages on that last chart, does not have a, defini a rigorous definition. It's got a manual, it's got documentation, but that's not a definition. 
Um, then there are two serious implementation issues that C doesn't have. Uh, languages that, that do garbage collection often have the problem that the garbage collector will sort of you know, worm its way into the computation and do its work at unpredictable times and for unpredictable lengths of time. And there are some kinds of system software that, that you just can't write in, in those circumstances. And if, the process, and if the interruptions get long enough, they really annoy the users. Um, this is the big one that people typically tend to, tend to bring against Python. And I have another slide on that in a moment. And then there are two, two evolution issues. In Python in particular, um, they, they did a, a non-backward compatible <coughs> language, language revision, uh, which I think was a tragedy. Uh, and then there's, there's an issue of language and library escalation, which happens in all programming languages. You know, they add, they add more features, people write new software that, that uses those features, and then it becomes, which is then incompatible with older software or requires, uh, you know, perhaps shelling out some more money for a new, newer version of the language system. Um, not a problem with the languages that I had up there before. But so, so if, so if those languages, if Python and Java and JavaScript aren't the answer, um, well, what, what is, you know? Um, well, a lot of very smart people have been researching these issues for, for over half a century. And they come up with a lot of research languages that have better and earlier <coughs> contract enforcement, that, that enforcement than C or C++, or for, the, for that matter, Java, without paying anything like the performance penalties of Python <coughs> and, and the other really, really comfortable languages. So why haven't any of those languages been adopted? In fact, you probably haven't even heard of most of them. How many people here have ever have heard of Modula 3? OK, three people. How many of you have heard of iPhone? Three. So here are some obstacles to improvement of programming languages. The first is that, that it's really difficult to kind of thread your way uh, into a more, expressive and, and, and a more expressive language without either making certain things that you absolutely have to be able to express inexpressible or making things so awkward that nobody wants to use them. There's performance. That's the next slide. But then there are all these non-technical things. Um, there's a trade-off um, to to program in Eiffel or to program in a language that has you know that has really a really rich uh, expressive capabilities. Uh, takes more training and more experience and just more skill. Um, also, it, takes long, it probably takes longer to develop software. There's, there's a training versus adoption kind of chicken and egg problem. Um, it, it, takes a lot of, it takes a lot of effort to develop a language and standardize it and specify it well. Uh, businesses, you know, they make this trade-off. They say, okay, if we put relatively shoddy software out there, there's a cost, there's a cost to the customers, there's a cost to our reputation, but we have to balance that against the cost of actually improving the quality of the software. And it's very tempting for businesses to, to trade, a, trade off in favor of getting lower quality software out there faster. Uh, there's, some businesses may develop some you know, better quality, quality tools, but keep, them, but, but keep them to themselves for proprietary advantage. Um, I, have one, I know one instance of that. A friend of mine uh, uh, built a small company that, that did some work on static contract enforcement. Um, and um, Microsoft basically bullied them into selling all of the technology to them. Uh, and I can talk about how that bullying works after the talk if you're interested. And then, okay, I am not a conspiracy theorist, but I know some people who've done contract work for the NSA, for the CIA. I wouldn't rule out the possibility that, that intelligence agencies actually don't want software to be too too impenetrable. So I promised you a slide on performance, and there it is. And it is, <coughs> it is an eye opener. Um, I, I have the simple cryptographic algorithm. The, the, uh, the text, the, tech, the, the, the source code actually is also, will also be on the website. And <coughs> I, I, ran, I, I, I ran the identical code, as close as I could make it, on those four implementations. 
And I just want you to, to look at the, at the four run times for a moment. So that gives you a pretty good idea of why people might not want to take Python seriously as a system programming language. Um, OK, I'm going to skip the next slide. Uh, so I tried to think of you know, ways that we might be able to improve the situation. I came up with five, and, and they're all kind of fanciful and un unimplementable, which doesn't make me very happy, but at least I'll tell you what they are. Um, software has currently managed to, to weasel out of the uniform commercial code, which basically guarantees that anything that you buy will do, will do what it's supposed to do and not harm you. Instead, software has these obnoxious things called end-user license agreements, and they've been upheld by the courts. Um, if there was one thing that I wish could happen that I think would lead to a lot of improvement in the software, software quality that will also increase its price and decrease its, its, its timeliness and decrease its availability, but that I would still like to see happen, it would be to force software back under the uniform commercial code. Not going to happen. Um, a second thing that could happen and that has made an, a difference in some other circumstances is require government procurement of software to, 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 uh, to require best quality practices. I don't know the procurement process. I don't know whether any of that is feasible. Um, I've kind of dreamed of, of public shaming of offenders. I don't know how to make that work. I don't know if it would do anything. <coughs> it's one of those things that we can dream about. Um, and then, you know, there's a possibility of some kind of public-private public consortium or a large cash prize. I don't know. I mean, you know, I, you know who knows what these ideas are worth. So, so I didn't really want to end the talk on a pessimistic note, but I'm going to. Because on this particular to topic, I'm a pessimist. Sorry, folks. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. Yes, sir. What's your favorite like, recent like, language developed in the last three years, five years? Um, I don't use any languages that have been developed in the last five or 10 years. And as I said, I've been kind of out of the mainstream for about 15. Um, the, the languages that seem to be wobbling in the right direction are languages like um, maybe Go and Spark and Swift that, that make some attempt to bring the C tradition you know, forward into an environment where, where you know, there is at least garbage collection. Uh, but, they're, but they're not system programming languages. They're application programming languages. Um, uh, I, all of the software development that I have done in the last five years, except when I had to use something else, has been in, in JavaScript used as, a, used as a real programming language, not as a web programming language. Personal taste, we can talk about that after the talk. But so I don't have a favorite. I don't know enough. Yes, sir. Now, you mentioned that you left programming in about the year 2000 or so. Was it because of these reasons, or was it for an entirely different reason? Um, it was for entirely different reasons. Um, I, uh, I, I had been working on GhostScript more or less nonstop, full time, for about 15 years. And I was burnt out. And um, I went to uh, Vienna for the first time in my life, which is where my father grew up. And I was standing in the Museum of Old Musical Instruments in the Hofburg, and I realized I had a little epiphany. Um, I spent the previous year looking for the, my next big software project to do after GhostScript. And I had this little epiphany that I just didn't want to do software anymore. Uh, and that was the point at which I decided to go back to school and get a, get a couple of music degrees. Yes, sir. Um, why did you say the, that uh, software will never go under the uniform commercial code? Why is that? Um, because the, the pressure from software companies is too great. Um, they're, they're, they're in a good position right now to evade what I consider their responsibilities. Uh, and as, it, as I said, EULAs have been tested in, in court and found to be legally enforceable. Um, so, you know, I have to say, besides being pessimistic about this particular topic, I'm temperamentally a pessimist. So, you know, uh, one of the great things about being your age is that you can be optimists. It's, it, gets, it gets harder as you get older. <laughs> other, other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, how did Microsoft bully your friend's company? The um, so uh, the company's name was Intrinsa. And they had, they had some patents. And Microsoft came to them. <coughs> so let me say that this is hearsay. 
um, I, I can't tell you where I heard it from, uh, and, I, and I wouldn't testify to it in court, but I find it plausible. Microsoft came to them and said, look, guys, we know you have these patents, but we have an army of lawyers. We will go and patent every, every use case for these patents that we can think of. We will encircle you with patents that will make your patent essentially unusable if you don't, if you don't sell out to us. That's a story I heard, and I find it plausible, because that, that scenario has, in fact, happened in, in some other circumstances. Um, you know what? I think we're out of time. <coughs>